Welcome back to ABW in conversation with I am of course your host because it's my show that's what I do a uh, very special guest for you today uh, firstly thank you for everyone who has tuned in and given us some positive feedback because this series has gone down really really well so thank you very much to everybody who has tweeted and sent pigeons and fan mail and all of that jazz it's very much appreciated so let's wait no time I have got a guest today who uh, he has his own empire, his own Arsenal empire. Uh, I've uh, been a big follower and enjoyer of his uh, his product for quite a while. I hate that word, product. It's an awful word. But <laughs> his podcast, his talents. Uh, it's Elliot. Uh, you can block him on Twitter at Yankee Guna. How are you doing, Elliot? Yeah, I'm. I'm great. I really appreciate you having me on and. I'm doing my best to to keep a smile on my face in spite of Arsenal. <laughs> it's tough. Yeah, it, it's real tough. And uh, don't worry, dear listeners, we will cover a bit of Arsenal uh, later on in the pod. But, um, Elliot, I want to explore you, first of all, um, in a sort of a non-perverse way. Um, tell <laughs> Someone's me, got to. Yeah, indeed. Tell me a bit about how Arsenal Vision came to be, because uh, us, obviously, having been in the podcast world for a little while and a number of years now, um, for a while, it was like it was Ask Blog, maybe one or two others, Tuesday Club, and now all of a sudden, literally everyone and this dog, and even their dog, has an Arsenal podcast. Um, I think it's fair to say that yours stands out above a lot of the other ones. You know, content is very well produced. You've got some fantastic guests, and Paul, and I uh, kid, of course, and and you sort of built yourself, um, you know, a network, an empire, if you will. Tell me a bit about how that came to be and how you sort of built this this uh this sort of franchise and that's an awful word isn't it but this business that's a better word how no, did you come to be i like to think of it as a community but you know it, it's whatever we're much better use. empire is great because empires always last forever if history has taught us anything empires are are always going to succeed long term so that's good uh no i i think first of all you mentioned our blog and right I, I feel like none of us whether bloggers or podcasters would be here without him to some extent uh i started blogging because I read his blog and I wanted to be able to express myself in that way. And I started podcasting largely because I heard his voice and his perspective and wanted to have a chance to express myself similarly, uh, if less articulately. So, you know, that, that definitely was a big influence on me and obviously Andrew's the best. And then there, there's a friend of mine, Tim Clark and Dave Meekum, and we, we started podcasting together on, on Tim's podcast. And it was sort of lovingly known as the Doomcast. Um, and it's hard to believe that something that started 12 years ago could have been considered the doomcast looking at where we are now. But, you know, I think we, we tended to have sort of a cynical, sarcastic take on things. But they were lazy. It came out like once every six weeks if we were lucky. <laughs> and Linus, who runs, um, who runs Arsenal Vision website, arsenalvision.co.uk, uh, Mean Lean on Twitter, he said, hey, I'd, I'd like my website to have a podcast. Would you like to host it? And you know, I was I was sort of doing some podcasts. I'd had the chance to guest on on the Arscast, and I thought I'd like to do something a little more regularly. And writing's a hell of a lot of work, so I wanted to stop doing that. So uh, I, I agreed to do it, and it started with me and Paul and, and a third member, James. But I think, unfortunately, the tone initially was a little too argumentative. And as you probably find in a lot of shows, there is a tendency when you have strangers who come together and talk about Arsenal on a podcast or on, on a on a stream for it to sometimes tend towards that sort of embrace debate style, right? Where people are yelling at each other and sort of argumentative. And we really wanted to steer it away from that. And as it evolved, uh, we had Tim Stillman come on, uh, Stilberto on Twitter, and he has sort of a, a very intellectual and sophisticated way of talking about the club in a way that I think brought the tone a little closer to where we want to be. And then eventually Clive joined and he's very professorial. Um, he does some coaching himself. And I think what we landed on was a really nice balance of being emotional because we all care about Arsenal, but being able to analyze it in a way that that was a little bit more, uh, just maybe a little more level-headed. And not that we wouldn't get upset if there were things to be upset about, or we were always trying to be positive about it, but we were there to have a conversation, not to have an argument. And I really liked that. And I think what we wanted to do was create a situation where then on Twitter or on our Patreon Discord or wherever it was, we encouraged people to come be a part of that conversation in that way. And so it wasn't toxic or it wasn't, you know, uh, hyper hyperbolic or bombastic or anything like that. And over time, what I think really I've really appreciated about the podcast is it's improved the tone and nature of the conversations I have, not just on the pod, but on social media and with other people in the community and other people I come across because I found this way of talking about Arsenal where I can express my frustrations if they exist, but not in a way where it becomes uh abusive or toxic or unhealthy. And I think we all want football to be an escape 
and arsenal to be a joy in our life. And when it's not going well, finding the way not to let that become a, a real uh, emotionally draining experience is hard for some people. And so the, the podcast, I mean, this is probably getting deeper, deeper than you wanted, Chris, but like <laughs> the podcast is, has really helped me engage with a topic I care about tremendously with a group of people that also care about it tremendously, but in a way that I find actually brings me a lot of joy and fulfillment, despite the club not always bringing me <laughs> that same joy and fulfillment. So I know that's a long answer, um, but yeah, that that's really where it's come about. And over time, uh, the, the pod is sort of separated into being its own brand. And all I mean by brand is not necessarily associated with that website where it started, but now we're our own operation and we have the chance to do some live streams and some live events that we've had planned and canceled and planned again <laughs> and hopefully not canceled again. So yeah, it, it's great. And I I feel very lucky to have the group of of people that work on it with me because I think if any of them weren't there, Scott, who does our analytics, if any of them weren't a part of it, it wouldn't be as um, as great a group as it is. Yeah, yeah, well said. We uh, we try and give Danny credit for our, our website. We say, look, without him, nothing, none of this would happen. He refuses to take it, but it's true. You know, without that yeah. person at the helm and the team around you, it, it, it's tough. Um, talk to me about, like, why Arsenal then? You know, a lot of people, I mean, I, I was born in 83. I've followed the club since as long as I can remember, certainly growing up not far from Highbury. So it, it kind of was in my blood and it, it stuck. I'm always intrigued by when somebody does live abroad or, you know, is, is miles away from the club, there must be that one specific thing that captured your heart or mm. your emotions that took you into this wonderful world in which we live with, with the Arsenal at the helm. Where, where did that journey begin for you? Yeah. I think for a lot of Americans um, who are Arsenal fans, the timing couldn't have been wetter, better and worse in some respects because <laughs> the timing of the world cup where France was so dominant and so many of those Arsenal players were involved and maybe you played the FIFA game on, on a, a gaming platform and Arsenal were one of the fun teams to play with. And you know, those late nineties, right? 98, 2000, 2002, that era, whether it was, um, you know, I mean, certainly Thierry Henry became a big part of that, but I was also working in London at that time uh, out of college, 2001, 2099, 98, not regular. I wasn't living there, but I was regularly traveling there. And so I think the first Arsenal game I saw was Arsenal Newcastle FA Cup final. And just being in a pub surrounded by football fans, I'd been a sports fan my whole life and never experienced anything that was as just as passionate and energetic and exciting as that environment. And I just was very drawn to football because it was very different from the more transactional franchise type experience I got with American sports where you'd tune in, you'd tune out, you could care about your team. But again, it felt much more transactional and this felt much more emotional. And so as someone who was going to be working in London frequently, I wanted to have a club to support. I was playing, you know, the FIFA game with Arsenal. I was enjoying the <laughs> Arsenal players in the international games. And it may sound silly, but realize at that time, there was no way to watch Arsenal on TV in America. I mean, mm -hmm. literally you, you couldn't, the, the internet was just in its infancy and you could sort of find out what the scores were and that was about it. So you really had to want it. I really looked forward to those trips to London to engage with it or those video games to engage with it because that was my only outlet. And then the Champions League games started to be broadcast here and then eventually all the Premier League games. And so it's interesting, right? It was those first few years of just learning about it, getting connected to it, having to really seek it out. And when you have to pursue your club, when you have to pursue the chance to see the odd game, when it becomes, you know, like Christmas, the chance to actually get to watch a game, you really start to care about it, look forward to it. So that by the time it became more easy to do, I was totally hooked. And I felt somehow that having to work for that uh, connection to the club made it mean more to me. And then look, you start blogging, you start writing about the club every single day and ultimately podcasting and talking about the club every single day, it just becomes built into your life. So I don't have that community connection or that family connection, but I do feel like I I had to work to, to build this connection with the club. And I think like a lot of people of my generation or thereabouts who fell in love with football and Arsenal around that time, we were very fortunate, right? We had the early 2000s, we had the invincible seasons, we had the double winning seasons, we had a, a wonderful team to watch. But <laughs> none of us could have predicted what was to follow. No, 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 indeed. No, that just brings almost a tear to the eye thinking about the good days, doesn't it, where we are now? Long time ago. But tell me a bit about um, sort of what it's like uh, being in the States and, and, and following Arsenal, because I think it's fair to say that like, the Premier League has exploded 
overseas and particularly in, in the to a US audience. Obviously, you've got the feeds. I, I believe you can get most of the 3 p.m. games, can't you, on a regular basis? Every single and game, yeah. <laughs> if, even better. Yeah. And, and, and obviously, in the US, you know, you automatically think of, of NBA, of NFL, like the big franchise sports. But, but football or soccer, if you prefer, it is growing mm. over there. Um, how, how have you sort of seen that develop? Because I guess 10 years ago, you might see the odd Manchester United Liverpool shirt. Now you are seeing, you know, the big clubs. You're seeing the Arsenal's, the Chelsea's, the Man City's, the Liverpool's, the Sp- not them. But, you know, every other, you know, the big clubs. And, and you're probably seeing, I, I guess, a few lower league clubs and and people that are just taking the, the sport to their heart. How do you think that the American kind of um, audiences have taken to it and, and having their access to it? Do you feel like it is still growing even to this day? Yeah, I mean, the domestic league is, I don't want to say thriving, but certainly succeeding and drawing a lot of fans to the ground. And that helps, right? Anything that builds interest in the game. There's just no getting away from the fact that the the prominence of social media combined with the accessibility of the game on television, those two things have really driven the game to new heights because now not only can you watch every single game, but before, you know, when I would watch Arsenal 15, 20 years ago, even if I could watch the game, I didn't have anyone to go watch it with. I didn't have anyone to call up and talk about it with. I experienced it very much in my own cocoon of isolation. Um, where a lot of people feel that I should be kept. But like the, the reality is that social media means that you're always in that pub, right? You're always surrounded by those other fans. And so people that aren't at the ground or able to just walk to their local and be surrounded by you know fans supporting the same club or just supporting watching the Premier League regardless, now you can get on Twitter or Instagram. Well, not Instagram so much, but like Twitter and join a community and, and have a conversation about the game as it's going on, lose your rag, you know, cheer and scream and yell and throw a tantrum and whatever the case may be. And so that I think has really helped foreign fans and certainly fans in America connect with the game, the ability to watch every game and then feed back with each other about every game. Um, and it is interesting, right? Cause I, I think back to when I got on Twitter in 2009 and I would try to tweet about Arsenal just the amount of times you'd be met with something like stick to baseball, right? Largely because my opinions suck. So fair enough. But like, and now it's not that you never hear that. And I understand there's some antipathy towards Americans because of American ownership and the perception of how American ownership influenced the rise of the, the mooted super league. But like, you really don't get that reaction as much. So I think the game has globalized. And to some extent, I think the, the fans of the game, even closer, you know, to North London, have at least accepted that those global fans, if not maybe being the same kind of support are still a valuable part of the supporter community. So it's been nice to see that develop. And I mean, maybe that's not everyone's experience, but that's at least been mine. Yeah. Yeah. Good answer. That. I like that. And you touched on it briefly there. And I, I always like to ask people that, that create content, this kind of question, because it fascinates me. What's your view on social media and, and how it's developed? Because we see so many good signs and we see so many bad signs there's very little in between and you know the, the dawn of the internet troll um and the people that that you know words can be very hurtful and and one thing i found when i first started podcasting was that uh, for a while like you and i was on twitter in the first days i would reply to every tweet you know i'd feel like i was rude if i didn't reply and i'd want to mm-hmm. interact with people and i've very sort of over the over the years i've learned to just kind of let water slide off the back certain people are just not going to agree with what you say sometimes you're going to be reactional and say something that doesn't go down the right way um sometimes you're going to have an opinion and i think people overlook the fact that when we record these shows whether it's visually audio whatever people hang on your every word um, even if you are like us, so just an everyday you and me, you know, we're not celebrities, but people do hang off your every word. And that I often find it never fails to am- amaze me when somebody digs out a tweet that you posted in 2006 or, you know, we didn't think that 20 years ago. How do you manage and deal with that within your podcast and in your community? Because there must be a lot of pros and a lot of negatives to that side of things. So it, you kind of reminded me of that um, that cartoon I've seen somewhere. It shows a guy feverishly typing away at his computer and uh, his partner's off frame saying, honey, come on. And he says, one minute, honey, somebody's wrong on the internet. You know, and it's like <laughs> that need to tell someone. And I do understand that frustration. Right? I'll listen to podcasts and someone says something that drives me crazy. I'm like, they're so wrong. I have to tell them how wrong they are. You know, and it's because you can't directly engage in that conversation. Well, what Twitter does, it gives you a way to then run to your computer and tell that person how wrong they are. So I understand that instinct. I do think there's a a sense of 
you know, in the old news business, they used to say, if it bleeds, it leads, right? Mm -hmm. That if you had a, a gory story of something terrible happening, that's how you got viewers and that should lead the news. And I think that leads the way we think about social media. There are terrible people in the world. And as a result, there are terrible people on social media and they behave terribly. Um, that stinks and it needs to be corrected. And social media companies certainly need to work on how they manage that problem. But overwhelmingly, every day, millions and millions and millions of tweets and messages to people are sent that engage in intelligent discourse and witty banter and, you know, supportive messaging. And like, it sounds ridiculous to say this, but overwhelmingly, my experience on Twitter is that people are wonderful, that we have great conversations, that we uh, people make me think more deeply about the club and about football. They help me learn things I never would have learned otherwise. And yeah, then there'll sometimes be a troll who's like, you know, go kill yourself. That sucks. And you block that person and you move on. I think the problem is, right, if you're a big enough celebrity, instead of one person telling you to do that, it might be 10,000 people. Mm -hmm. And at that level, and, and the abuse can be way worse than that. It can be racially motivated. I mean, think about this just as a numbers game. Let's say you're a player. And let's say Arsenal have 10 million supporters on Instagram, right? And let's say 2 million of those supporters are young men age 13 to 18. And of those 2 million supporters, one-tenth of 1% 1 don't have any self-control and write nasty messages. That's a tiny, tiny fraction. One-tenth of 1% 1 of one little segment of the fans on Instagram. But that's still 10,000 or 20,000 abusive messages. And so it becomes a numbers game, right? And I, I think that's really the challenge, which is how do we contextualize the fact that there's so many wonderful people, supportive messages, good conversations, and yet this noisy, toxic subset of people who can't control themselves really find a way to pull focus and destroy the tapestry of that social experience that we're having together. I don't know if it's, you know, I, what I don't like is when people are like, oh, Arsenal supporters are the worst. Look at this thing they did. I mean, People are bad. There are bad yeah. people and they do bad things in every fan base and every subset, you know, in every cultural category we want to find. Somehow you have to find a way to marginalize that part of the experience so you can really enjoy the other part of it. And that's not me, by the way, saying it's up to the victim, right? I'm not saying if you've been a victim of social media abuse, it's your job. I don't know the answer. If I did, I, I'd probably be doing something a lot more productive <laughs> with my life uh, and lucrative potentially. But but I think that uh, for me, and I can only speak for me, I've found luckily a good balance of being able to have really enriching, productive, supportive conversations on social media and ways of tuning out the ones that aren't. And that, that works for me. And I'm not suggesting that that can work for everybody. Mm, yeah, it's all about sort of picking and choosing who you interact with and and almost like having that ability to kind of go, this conversation's going in a direction that's just not going to work. I'm going to walk away. And that's something that I've learned you know, even recently, you just sometimes you you're just not going to agree with someone, and you're just going to have to say, you know what, that's fine, that's your opinion. I disagree. We move on, and and that's that. Yeah. How do you, in terms of um, again, just sort of talking about your your podcast and, and your community, you um you touched on at the start of this season, uh, one of your pods, and you were sort of saying we're not in Europe this season, which we'll come on to in a minute, mm -hmm. um and and it gave you the opportunity to maybe try a few new things. I'm always intrigued as well. Danny and I have this conversation all every summer. You know, what can we do? What can we do that's new? And, and a few years ago, we had this novel concept idea of doing a post-match show. Um, and look where that's gone. You know, everybody loves doing them these days. And we've actually yep. stopped doing them because it's just a nightmare to, to arrange them. But mm. it, it, how do you sort of evolve? Do you, do you look at it as a, do you get together as a team? Or do you just wake up in the middle of the night in cold sweat and go, that's a brilliant idea. We're going to do that. I'd love to say that it was the former. Weirdly, <laughs> it just seems to wind up being more of the latter because I think inspiration comes in unexpected moments. And like sometimes it you can't catch lightning in a bottle. It's like I was I was reading some kind of marketing thing once where it was talking about how to like how to grow your business. This was years ago when I was doing something else with my life. And they're like, one of the best ways you can do it is to have a viral tweet or viral video that's seen by hundreds of millions of people. And I'm like, oh, why didn't I think of that? I'll just have a viral video, right? Like it it isn't the case that you can necessarily plan for, for having a brilliant idea. I think what we've tried to do is avoid just doing extra content for extra content's sake and do it if it's accretive, do it if people like it. So we have match rewatches that we do where 
usually Clive and I, but other guys will come on. We'll watch the match and analyze it in a more tactical way in the cold light of day. We have scouting videos where we'll get on Y scout and scout potential transfer targets, you know, not like your typical sort of YouTube hype video, but really breaking them down on a more granular level. And that's a benefit of having a coach in the group in Clive who is more conversant with that kind of analysis. We have an analytics podcast that Scott does where they dive into the data we do still have the sort of fun emotional stuff. Like uh, we do an instant reaction podcast literally at full time of every single game that gets out that sort of emotional reaction. So when we do our full post-match analysis, it can be a little bit more removed from the heat of that emotion. So we, you know, we've tried to build up these different things. We have a premier league roundup show, uh, live streams pre-match for midweek games. That won't be a big feature this season, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but you know, I, I think the key, right. It doesn't matter what your concept is, what your hook is, what your, you know, um, what type of content you're creating if if it's not good. So the, the goal for us is always to try to maintain a level of conversation that people will benefit from. So having people on who have something valuable to say and add, I host it, I just keep it ticking over, but it's the other guys who really have a lot of, I think, valuable insight to, to include. And every once in a while, you know, get lucky. I think we're going to have Lee Dixon on the show coming up next week, which would be great. You know, we'll have some specialists who are fans of a club that we might be buying a, a, a player from or other podcasters. But mostly it's our core group setting a, a standard for the level of conversation so that when we try a new concept, the most important thing is that it, it's, it, it lives up to what hopefully we set as a standard for people to expect. Yeah, yeah, well said. Yeah, and it's uh, it's it's tough, isn't it, to manage? There's so there's so many different things, so many intricacies to come up it's with. Full time job, yeah, it really feels that way. Yeah, absolutely, keeping it fresh and and all mm -hmm. that that goes with it. Um, just before we we take that slippery slide in, into Arsenal territory, I just want to kind of transition to it into sort of talking about football in general and and the Premier League. What do you feel like the standard is at the moment? Um, a lot of the, the view, regular viewers of this podcast will know that French football is my thing outside the Premier League. Um, John, who's part of the podcast, Forest, follows Serie A. Uh, Josh is very much all about the championship and, and we've had others in the past for other leagues. And we kind of like to think that we can have a balanced view on which leagues we follow and how good they are compared. There is this sort of wording, if you like, greatest league in the world for, mm. for the Premier League. I mean, how, how does it compare for you? I mean, be honest, Like, do, do you take in other leagues as well or is it, is it mainly about the Premier League for you and, and what sort of standard do you feel it's at, at the moment? I do watch the other leagues. I mean, some of that is down to what is easy for me to watch in terms of the streaming services or channels that that carry it, right? So now like uh, La Liga is very easy to watch here. The Bundesliga is very easy to watch here. League on, unfortunately, is harder to watch. And it's a league I'd love to watch for obvious reasons. <laughs> Not just, um, you know, Messi at PSG, but also uh, Ganduzi and, and Saliba at Marseille, for example. Um, I, I think I enjoy all the different leagues, but I do think where the premier league has an advantage is top to bottom, the depth of the league. And so the feeling that the games can be pretty competitive top to bottom. I think the French league is actually a, a hell of a lot of fun to watch when I have watched it. I think the football can be a lot of fun. The pace of the premier league. Certainly I know it's, a, it's, it has almost become mythical the pace of the premier league, but I think it, it is a real thing. And I think it, it makes it more exciting to watch. But I think what last season showed me, Chris, is that the real magic of the premier league is having fans in the ground. Because mm -hmm. last season, it just felt stale to me. And I hated last season. Now, some of that's because of what we went through as a club. <laughs> but then I watched the Euros and I was like, what's happening to me? Club football was stale, but international football is rekindling my love of the game. And you look at it and you realize it's because of the fans, right? And mm -hmm. so already this season, as disappointing as it has been, like that Brentford game broke my heart in some ways. But what an extraordinary kickoff to the season. It was just the atmosphere and the the you know, the sound of, of the fans being back. So I think where the Premier League has its advantage and where it lost it last season is the atmosphere that you get at the ground and the way that transmits even through the screen and the energy it gives you as a viewer. So I think the standard of football is maybe a little higher top to bottom. There's a sense of competitiveness. I mean, I, you couldn't guess who's going to take the, the European spots in the Premier League this season, maybe outside the top four anyway. But it's it's that energy that, that transmits from from the fans through to the viewers, even uh, through the TV screen, that for me really sets the Premier League apart. And we saw how much that was missed last season with a season that I think was pretty stale. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Yeah, I, I must admit, I in all of the years I supported Arsenal last year was the most disengaged I've ever been. And yeah, yeah. I think, as you say, some of it was a result of what was on the pitch, but it was just, it just didn't feel the same. I couldn't get that 
in a drive up but it just just didn't feel right um that leads us on to to where we are right now and i feel like we can spend the sort of last 20 minutes we've got also to to discuss this because yeah. there is so much to discuss um i mean uh, let me tell you where i am so i mean i i i'm a guy who i always like to support who we've got both players management um even even the Cronkies, I think, to a degree, get a bit of a hard rap. I'm not saying they're the best owners out there, but I feel there could be a lot worse. I'm a positive person. I like to see the good in, in everyone and everything. Um, this current Arsenal setup is trying my patience uh, heavily of right now. Uh, and I like Mikel Arteta. I really do. And, and I, I try and I always feel like it's a, a meme by me saying I like him, but cause it just keep saying it. I want him to succeed. But and the but I have is... I really worry about the direction we're going in. And I worry that maybe as good a guy as he is and as good a talker as he is and as good as his his intentions are, I just wonder and I just worry whether this might be a step too far. If we exclude last season and we just look at the here and now, where is your feeling on, on current events at the club? It's super complicated because there are a lot of mitigating circumstances that you have to factor into your analysis. There's the pandemic shutdown and the no fans in the stands and the, the bad contracts that had to be gotten rid of and the way the squad was very imbalanced when he took over. There's the fact that a first time coach stepped into a situation where there was really no stability behind the scenes. Sven Mislintat goes, then Raul goes and Edu is there 10 minutes and has never operated in the European market. And suddenly Arteta is just made manager and he has this initial big success that you know, he wins the FA Cup, he's name manager, he's riding very high in his first job, and maybe didn't really ever get to understand the scope and scale of the project facing him. There's a lot of sharp clubs in the Premier League now and the way they operate in the market. We don't have anything like that experience behind the scenes. So whatever he wants to do as a coach is someone undermined by the environment he's working in with a guy in v who's pretty inexperienced as a football person, Edu, who has no experience in the European market, and Arteta, who's never managed before. That right there is a recipe for disaster. To expect a first-time coach to overcome that, he doesn't just have to be good, he has to be exceptional. And Clive has a saying, you know, he's in the washing machine now, the Arsenal washing machine. I think Arteta <laughs> is in that a bit. I think his man management style has been potentially questionable. I don't think Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is a great manager tactically coaching just seems like a guy who puts his arm around the shoulder of his players and lets them go have fun and they have enough talent that it works out. We don't have anything like their talent right now, unfortunately. But I do wonder if somewhere between the really rigid, uh, dogmatic, tactical approach Arteta wants from his players and that more sort of laissez-faire arm around the shoulder approach, there is a happy medium. I think a lot of us got frustrated with Arsene Wenger because we felt he was more of one way and we wanted a little more of the other. Now I think we're maybe over on the other extreme a bit. But again... Start of the season, Brentford, a lot of players missing because of COVID and other other issues. Chelsea, same thing happens, and that would have been a hard game regardless. So I always feel like whenever you want to get your hands around the Arteta issue and say, here's how I feel, there are these weird mitigating circumstances that you're always like, well, should I cut him some slack because he didn't have a, a senior striker for opening night? Should I cut him some slack because he didn't have either of his first choice central defenders against the champions of Europe? And like, you're always sort of balancing those two things. My ultimate sense is, and I, I said this to someone earlier today, we're almost two years into the Arteta experience. If two years into your manager being there, no one's totally sure if the manager is good, it's probably not good enough, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, because think about this. A great manager is probably only going to stay at your club about five seasons now. A great one. Yeah. The goal should be to cycle through managers until you find one that seems to really be pushing you ahead. And that's how Liverpool did it, and Leicester have done it, and Chelsea do it, and City do it, and United do it. But here's the problem at Arsenal. The guy you're cycling through is also the guy picking the talent. Mm -hmm. And that's the danger. Because you've given him all of this authority to pick the squad. And now, if you move on from him, you get another guy in who says... What have you left me with? And so that does make it more complicated. But I think, Chris, my, my ultimate sense is if almost two years into your manager being there, some people hate him, fine. That'll always be the case with any manager. But you're not sure he's good? That's a problem. You mm. By now, you should be sure either we need to move on or this is the guy. He's taken us where we need to go. And the fact that we don't know that yet, I think, is in itself 
probably a little bit dispositive for me. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I can't disagree with any of that. The One of the things that frustrates me as an Arsenal fan taking in various sort of media and social media and podcasts and everything else, there is a, a lot of the time the out for Arteta is, is often, well, it's either not his squad or the players aren't good enough. You know, this, this club shouldn't be anywhere near top six because look at the players. I look at our squad right now and even before the summer incomings which are, you know have improved it i i just genuinely think that the squad is actually not as bad as people think and i look at you know look at what west ham did last night i'm not saying david moyes is a bad manager he's clearly a very good manager and west ham at the moment is a good fit but if you lay out that squad on paper how many of those players are arguably better than arsenal but what they have got is a clear tactical approach a clear uh, sort of uh, ethos and how they how they how they play games. They play to their strengths. They've got a player in Antonio who's just all bluster and thunder. Um, and with us, I don't know. It just always feels like there's just too much going on. Whether it's too much tactical tweaking, as you say, too much rigidity. What do you make of this current squad right now? And, and what you know? Do you, do you think that this squad under whether it be Arteta or not, whether it be just under a manager who is very good, you know, a high-level manager. Do you think it is a squad that's capable of top six or higher, or, or are we overestimating it? I think that, first of all, the squad is a mess, and part of that is because of Arteta. I, mm. I mean, I, you know, and I'm not pinning it all on him, but he's the man. The buck stock stopped somewhere. Aubameyang's still here because he wanted him here. You know, Williams yep. here because he wanted him here, at least presumably. Well, not here anymore, to be fair. Some of the guys who maybe could have helped aren't here because he didn't want them here. And it is just the fact that between the 32-year-old Aubameyang and 30-year-old Lacazette, right, and 32-year-old Willian, we have 19 and 20-year-olds. And really yep. nothing in between besides Pepe. You know, could central midfield be better if we decided to move on from Shaka? He didn't want to do that. So... Some, if you regard the squad as a problem, you have to regard some of that as his problem. Ainsley Maitland Niles could have been sold last summer. Cedric didn't need to be signed. The right back situation is a mess in part because this is what he wanted it to be. And we wanted to put our money into a goalkeeper and a center back. And that's what we did. I think the thing with Arteta for me is fine. He came in, he put in structure, he made us harder to play against. At no point have I seen strong enough evidence that he can get the very talented, if inexperienced, attackers to play at or above their level. You know, at some point, your job as a manager is to get the most out of the, the, the pieces your team has. And I just think the, ta the attack has not been good enough. Arsenal fans will tolerate some disappointment, as we've seen. I don't think we'll tolerate disappointment and bad football. And no. for me, the thing that's made the Arteta experience less enjoyable isn't the results you could set that aside. It's that the results have come in some pretty drab, unappealing football. And even when we were getting on a bit of a run towards the end of last season, I still don't think the football really got to the level that it, that it captured your imagination. So can Arsenal be a top six side? Of course they can. Because ultimately, between Leicester, Spurs, Villa, West Ham, I mean, Everton, we're in that group two of those teams are going to finish in the top six and they're going to finish in the top six because their manager will get the most out of them more than those other teams. I think it is a failure in the market that we haven't used our resources to distance ourselves. How can you be the biggest spenders in the Premier League and not feel like you've distanced yourself from West Ham and Villa and Everton? That to me is inefficient. And then on the pitch, okay, you've got some talent. Pepe, Saka, Smith-Rowe, Odegaard, Aubameyang, Lacazette. I mean, are they perfect? No. They have to score goals. They have to get chances. And right now, these guys sort of have looks like they're seeing ghosts out there on the pitch. They're not getting near the box. They're not creating shots. Even when we have the good passages of play against Chelsea, we had a really bright 15, 20 minutes. And I looked, no shots. Halftime, two shots. So, mm. And that's Chelsea. I get it. They're good and we're missing players. But Chris, I will, I will definitely admit that my bias as someone who grew up on Arsenal during the Arsene Wenger era is if the results aren't there, at least excite me with the football. But if you're not doing either, then patience is going to be hard to come by. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I completely agree. I, the, the thought of paying money to go and watch games at the moment is not, it just, just doesn't appeal to me, you know? And I mean, I live geographically four or five miles, uh, 
four or five hours in mileage um, away from the ground. The thought of getting up at 5 a.m., getting on a bus and a cramped seat and going and watching a game and then coming back the same day, that used to excite me. Like, genuinely, it was like, this is my treat. I'm going to go to the Arsenal. And this is a guy who, in my youth, I had a season ticket and obviously now moving away and growing up and, and not having money because the real world hits you quite hard. It's it's not so easy to go to games. And I, I genuinely feel for some of these fans who it's it's in their blood it's it, it is their escape and they go to that that mm. game they work 40 50 hour weeks they go to the game to be entertained or at least get a smile and that smile seems to disappear quite quickly with the football we're playing yeah. at the moment and it, it does it does kind of suck what do you um what would you change i mean i know i know that's like a massive question to to just throw out there and there's so many things but what if if you were Mikel Arteta right now, and we've heard him come out today, and I must admit I bit a little bit on social media early on, like did say how much longer Mikel when he says it will take time, mm -hmm. and there's the process and everything that goes with it. Trust what, the process. Trust the process. <laughs> what would you What would you do? I mean, would is it literally a case of we're recording this on the twenty fourth? We've got West Brom in the cup tomorrow. You and I both know beating West Brom twenty three nil changes nothing, but it does at least get the smiles in it. Yeah. It helps. And is that the case? Is it because my argument is always to use an arsenalism, Mikel, just take the handbrake off. You know, let Pepe lose the ball seven times in a game, but win you the game by going on ten mazy dribbles. You know, let Aubameyang express himself as a centre forward. Play him and Lacazette together if you can get them both in the same side. Just take the, the handbrake off. What would you do to change the, the, the way this team plays? Yeah, I mean, I think first of all, and it's one of the shortcomings that we've had under Mikel Arteta is win the ball higher up the pitch. Yeah. Just find a way to get this. To, like watching us press against Brentford was embarrassing because yeah. they could do it and we couldn't. Now, admittedly, look at the team we had. Fine. We couldn't do it against Chelsea either. But I think it's been a problem his entire time. One guy chases the ball and everybody else watches him do it. Nobody yeah. closes down the passing lanes. And here's the problem, right? Last season, we had the slowest attack in the league and the deepest starting position of possessions. What does that tell you? It tells you that for us to score a goal or even create a chance, we have to be more perfect than everybody else. Leno has to play it to a center back, who has to play it back to Leno, who has to play it to a center back, who has to play it to a full back, who has to play it to a midfielder back, to a full, you know, and on and on and on, up the pitch, up the pitch, up the pitch, to hopefully fashion a chance to maybe score a goal. When that works, don't get me wrong, it can be brilliant. But do you know how much easier it is to score a goal? If you win the ball back 18 yards from it, if you win the, I mean, the funny thing is look at how we won the FA cup, right? You nick the ball off the goalkeeper and you, yeah. you put it in the, in the back of the net and everybody's thrilled. Like, you know, I, I don't like to reference Liverpool too much. Cause I think it's overdone the extent to which people point to Liverpool as the model. Although I understand why, but like one of the reasons pressing works, one of the reasons Brentford came up with the press is when you don't have all the talent in the world, you make the game a lot easier when your possessions start in transition, their defense isn't set. You're higher up the pitch. Your attacking players can attack space instead of a low block, right? A, a compact defense. So that would be the first thing. I, if I were Mikel Arteta, instead of trying to have the slowest attack in the league with the slowest attack again or third slowest against Brentford on opening night, find a way to win the ball higher up. Find a way to get more transition opportunities where those dynamic, and you've got a team that can press. Martinelli can be a pressing agent, right? ESR can definitely do it a little bit. Get those guys up there. Maybe when Thomas Party's back, that will help. I think Granite Shack is an impediment there, but that's another story. So that would be part one. And then part two would just be in possession. I would paint a rectangle in the middle of the pitch from the center stripe to the top of the box. And I would say, if the ball doesn't go into that area once during every buildup, you're on the bench the next game. Because the extent to which our players just rely on wide overlaps. Granite Shaka's passes old, always to Tierney, never to the center of the pitch. Get more central. Pepe and the left winger, whoever it is, Saka Martinelli, and the striker, at some point in every buildup, should be no more than three or four yards apart from each other so that they can connect. We don't create those central connections. You look what they did with Lukaku against us and, and just those Mount Havertz and Lukaku floating around that central space and how it killed us. And I get it. We don't have a focal point like, like Lukaku. Aubameyang's not like that. A lot of us want Lacazette gone. But before I turn this into a huge ramble, which I'm already in danger of doing, <laughs> I'd press more and I'd force those attackers to get more central and, and force players to find ways to have more access to the center spaces of the pitch. If you look at the way City creates their goals or Chelsea creates their goals, they go in to go out. We just go out 
and the ball is out there on the wing, and then crosses go into no one, and then Mikel tells you it's math. If you put in enough crosses, you'll win the game. <laughs> I, I haven't I haven't seen that to be the case. I'm sorry to pick on him, but that you know that's a quote from last season. People remember. So that'd be it for me, Chris. I'm not a coach. I don't know what I'm talking about, but I'd I'd make it easier on us by winning the ball back in transition with a press. And I'd try to get a little more access to central spaces so those talented attackers can can feed off each other more. Yeah, yeah, well said, well said. Um, final question I want to ask you about is um, this intrigues me because again, in in the sort of the line of work you're in and producing content, etc. Um, the Amazon documentary. Um, I have to ask. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, f- from what I can gather, this this kind of spawned um, initially. It was a it's a big thing in the US, isn't it? Right, a lot of the NFL clubs have done this and. The, the kind of the almost behind the scenes uh, look at, at sports clubs, sports franchises, and indeed just the, the media industry as a whole. Um, it's very, very big in the US and, and it has certainly come over here. In, and obviously we've seen Man City, we've seen Spurs, we've seen Sunderland uh, to a lesser degree, Leeds. Um, what What's your view on it? I mean, we're all going to watch it. We'd be kidding ourselves if we said otherwise. Of course, we're going to watch it. It, it has the potential to be either really, really good or really destructive, doesn't it? What's your kind of viewpoint on that? And it, do you think it's a it's an own goal for the club PR-wise or could it actually prove to be quite beneficial? Well, let me throw it back on you. What's what's your what's your take on it? I'm I'm horrified. <laughs> I'm really worried about I, I can't wait to see. You know, Obama Yang and, and Lacazette doing a little dance as we draw nil nil at Burnley. I do. You know, I just, I just worry that we're going to be a bit of a paradigm of ourselves, and uh, I'm worried. I want to be wrong, but I'm worried. Yeah. I, I, look, I think for one thing, first of all, I'm not saying football doesn't work this way. Football doesn't work this way where you get to say, look how good we were post Boxing Day last season. It doesn't work this way where you get to say the season starts, you know, after the international break the season because it doesn't. But sometimes you just have to swallow the pill you're given. And the pill we're given this season is I do think I am going to fight with every ounce of myself to refrain from having any strong conclusions until we're five or six games past the international break because of the COVID situations and the the teams we put out and the fixtures, Brentford notwithstanding. I think the West Brom game is an interesting one, by the way, because just as an aside, I think people are willing to be a bit forgiving of these first three games because of the COVID situation, because of who we were playing. But if we don't score any goals and don't beat West Brom, I think people will say, well, where's where's any sign that there's there's hope here? So as dumb as it sounds for a second round League Cup game to matter, I think it sort of matters because we don't want to be four games into our season with no goals scored and no wins. Yep. But yeah, I mean, you know what, Chris? He's either, he's either going to get it right in that run after the international break or he's not. And patience is not a virtue for a lot of football fans. But if we just bite our tongue for a minute and accept that there's a run of games he has to win after the international break, he's either going to sink or swim. I I really believe that if we are willing to be a bit patient, we're going to get the answers we need then a lot more than we are now, if that makes sense. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's all going to get caught on film, regardless. So, whether yeah, oh, oh, sorry. Well, yes, I didn't even answer your your question. I apologize. That's all right. Everyone, <laughs> down my own cul-de-sac there, just like Arsenal. No, I well. So that was what I was going to say is that like the brand that is Arsenal is struggling, and as dumb as this is going to sound, if the all or nothing documentary leads more people to be interested in Arsenal and pulls in people who say, "I want to follow the journey of this team," they're you know they're down and out. Let me you know let me see what they're about. Like. We need all the fans we can get right now. We need to stay in that group of teams that you might say, you know, is one of the biggest clubs in the world. You know, we we throw that out there, but we're a mid-table team right now. I understand why it could be embarrassing and no one likes having the piss taken from, you know, rival fans, but it will make Arsenal sort of a, a talked about team. And as a team that's not in the Champions League and not in the Europa League and not competing for a title and not competing probably for top four, just to be talked about at all might actually be helpful. That might be painful for us as fans, but in the long run, as silly as it sounds, staying in the conversation, staying relevant might might just wind up benefiting us in the long term. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can't disagree with that. I do think there, there's definitely pluses to it. It's just I hope they are they are pluses and not too many negatives. We shall see. Um, okay, perfect. Well, before we round uh, round things off for today, um, please do tell us to uh, or tell our, our listeners and our viewers um, where they can find you, what sort of things you've got coming up, and any other any other bits and bobs you might want to plug. 
Yeah, well, you can go to arsenalvisionpodcast.com and check out everything about the pod. Um, we have our 500th episode next week. We're going to have some uh, great guests on for that. We're going to be kicking off our Arsenal Foundation fundraiser. So if you want to give back to the community that the club serves, and they, they have a, a cause called Save the Children, we'll be talking more about that. We'll be raising money all September. Uh, our goal is to hit 20,000 pounds, and, and I'm sure we can do it. I, I know everybody will give generously. So that'll launch next Monday with our 500th episode. And uh, other than that, we have the football content awards coming up and we somehow got nominated for that. So if you want to vote for us, you can just click on the pin tweet under the Arsenal vision account, Arsenal V podcast and tweet it out, but certainly no pressure vote for whoever you love. Tim Stillman, who's on our pod. He's also nominated as a content creator for women's football and, and he's the best in the business for that. So you can vote for him too, but more than anything, just happy to have the conversation and, and come back and talk to you more in the future and hopefully talk about how it all worked out and how it turned around and, <laughs> and how the unexpected uh, title campaign got off to a bad start, but, but magically turned around after the international break. Yeah. We're going to look really stupid when we left the title. I hope in, so. In May, I uh, always 50 hope 50 for points. that. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I hope that, yeah. It's as, as a famous person once said, it's the hope that kills, isn't it? So um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Uh, we of course will um, quite happily retweet your, um, your uh, donation page as well when that goes live. So let yep. us know next we'll... Monday or this coming right. Monday. Yep. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. We'll support you in that journey. Brilliant. Well, um, thank you, Elliot. It's been a real pleasure. It's the first time I've actually met you, uh, yes. sort of face to face, I guess you would call it. So, um, so yeah, really, really enjoyed having you. And um, as I said at the start of the show, a big fan of, of your work. I'm sure a lot of our listeners, uh, if they've got any taste, they'll listen to both podcasts. So um, hopefully they'll be they'll be tuning in as usual. And um, yeah, if you haven't already, you can uh, you can also. Elliot's too humble to mention it, but you do have a. Uh, patreon page that people can join you and have access to the discord as well so uh, jump on over if you've got a spare couple of quid and enjoy the content coming out um but yeah elliot thank you very much it's been a pleasure really really pleased to have you and uh, all the best yeah. for the future thank you same to you thanks so much you're very welcome. So uh, thank you very much to Elliot. And of course, for all of you for tuning in today, uh, this will be in vi in video format on YouTube. So if you want to see me uh, and Elliot in all of our glory, please do tune in. You can also see uh, my spot, which has joined us for this episode. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and mine uh, too, right? Here the... Absolutely. And uh, my beautiful flowing locks. Uh, but if that's not your bag, uh, hopefully you've enjoyed the audio. Uh, please do. If you do tune on YouTube, uh, drop us a thumbs up and all that jazz because it helps with Danny's algorithms and whatever the hell i don't understand it danny just does all that stuff. <laughs> but uh please do like that and let us know if you want to hear more there are big plans for more interviews coming up soon so if you do enjoy this let us know uh we will speak to you very soon my thanks once again to elliot and the crew and uh, we will catch you on the next one <laughs>